Welcome to At Home and Abroad with Harrison Walker. Join us each week as we follow our curiosity, diving deep into the familiar and the foreign. Reach beyond your front door as we uncover new perspectives, explore intriguing ideas, and have real conversations with the best guests. Ready for something different? Let's get started. Journalism can never be silent. That is its greatest virtue and its greatest fault. It must speak and speak immediately, while the echoes of wonder, the claims of triumph, and the signs of horror are still in the air. These are the words of Henry A. Grunwald. Born in Austria, Grunwald was an American journalist who served as the managing editor-in-chief of Time Magazine and all other Time publications. Wow, those words are really evocative, but they do belie the heavy responsibility that journalists bear. Oh, people do tend to romanticize journalism, don't they? Yeah, definitely. Particularly journalists in the field reporting in dangerous, tragic, or violent circumstances. Mm -hmm. There's this notion that a career in journalism can be a never-ending adventure in foreign lands, bringing those facts to light. Of course, this is not the life of all journalists, but they are detectives of sorts, all of them, sniffing out a story, drilling down leads, and exposing the truth. Right, like the newspaper reporter's stereotype of old, a man hunched over his typewriter, a cigarette clenched between his teeth, and a hat with a paper with the word press tucked in the band, working furiously to get that story to print. That is such (laughs) an accurate image, Walker. So do you think the career of a journalist was more straightforward back then than it is today? Maybe things are more complex today due to technology and misinformation, but I'm sure that there are many similar challenges as well. Right. Reporting events during periods of strife, war, and disaster, that could never be easy. I can't even imagine. There's always been some degree of risk, even danger associated with the profession. Whenever someone intends to uncover the truth, you're likely exposing people in events that wanted to stay in the shadows. Did you know that until my third year of university... I wanted to be a journalist as I well. I <laughs> did not know that. I actually considered it too a million years ago. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. I wanted to be a journalist throughout high school and even worked at my local radio station thinking it would be good training, you know, a stepping stone. Yeah, that's a good idea and very good planning on your part. So what interested you about journalism? I was really drawn in by drawing out stories, investigating the truth, curious mind and all that. Yeah, well, we know that you have a curious mind, Walker. (laughs) I think most aspiring journalists have a similar objective, and perhaps they truly want to make a difference in the world. Journalists can literally change the course of war, shed light on injustice, and improve the lives of the disadvantaged. As Marilo Camarado in his article for Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, University of Oxford, stated, many young people around the world still embrace journalism as an opportunity to investigate corruption, witness key moments in history, and report on injustice, famines, and war. It's not an easy profession, though, is it? Particularly today. Oh, definitely not. And it used to be really challenging for women to break into. Mm. Journalism was very exclusive to men for quite some time. Uncovering corruption or injustices was just not what well-behaved, proper women did. This isn't to say that there weren't women who challenged the status quo, though, and stepped outside of that stereotypical female role, pursuing their own story. That would have taken some chutzpah. You know it, most definitely. Nellie Bly was a trailblazer. Have you heard of her? I don't think so. Nellie Bly was a pen name of the American journalist Elizabeth Cochran, who lived between 1864 and 1922. She was a pioneer in the field of investigative journalism. Oh, wow. She was forced to leave school at a very young age as her father had died, but that did not hold her back. So how did she get into journalism? Well, apparently it all started when the Pittsburgh Dispatch published the article, What Girls Are Good for in 1885, which read like it sounds. Blech. It described the role of women being suitable for only having children and taking care of the house. Well, we know that's not true, <laughs> don't we, Walker? So this lit a little fire under her? It definitely did. Elizabeth's very candid written response to the article got her notice and ultimately served as a catalyst for a journalism career. Hmm. But she was not satisfied to write about fashion at the society page, which of course were the topics 
deemed appropriate for women journalists. Elizabeth really wanted to write about what interested her, things of substance, such as the lives of girls working in factories. Wow. One of her accomplishments was an expose on women's insane asylums for New York World. In order to be able to report on the inner workings of asylums, she needed to convincingly act insane in order to be committed. Wow, that would have been very dangerous at that time. You could be locked in there for life. Mm-hmm. Taking that risk really showed her dedication to exposing the truth and advocating for those who had little to no voice. It was really daring, truly dangerous, and luckily lawyers were able to free her after a couple of weeks. That sounds like a very harrowing experience, and I imagine it was a very unpleasant mm-hmm. couple of weeks. I would be terrified doing that even today. Once you're behind those locked doors, you've lost your agency. Yeah, scary. She also circumnavigated the world while reporting about her travels. I like and, this girl. I know, right? And this trip, for the most part, was unchaperoned. Oh, she was really pushing those <laughs> boundaries in the early 1900s. Women were always expected to be accompanied, right? By men. That's right. For most of the 72 days, she traveled unchaperoned and wore only one dress. One dress. I'm sure it looked pretty. She's scary at the end of that trip, but I love it. She embraces the carry-on, just like me. I think she must have been a very practical, no BS kind of gal. Well, she held the record for traveling around the world for a few months before her 72-day record was beaten by a man. Yeah, but did he do it in a single dress? Well, Harris, I suspect he did not. Then it's hardly comparable, (laughs) is it, Walker? Elizabeth was pretty impressive. Not only did she go to pretty remarkable lengths to get the story, she also pushed hard against the societal norms of the time, paving the way for the women behind her. She did. Her personal story and her remarkable accomplishments were retold in two movies, Escaping the Madhouse, the Nellie Bly story, and another, Ten Days in a Madhouse. We should have a screening, Harris. That's a really good idea, Walker. (laughs) Another trailblazing journalist was Catherine Clark, who further forged the way forward into field correspondence in post-World War II Eastern Europe. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Catherine Gregorio, the great niece of Catherine Clark, and the author of The Double Life of Catherine Clark, the untold story of the fearless journalist who risked her life for truth and justice. Welcome to At Home and Abroad, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we are very, very excited. And we were just chatting before we went live here with our interview about how much I really, really enjoyed your book. So I'm excited to get into it with you. So your book allows insight behind the Iron Curtain in the former Yugoslavia, but also into the real obstacles and dangers faced by journalists when working in the context of oppressive regimes. What do you think attracted Catherine Clark, who was your great aunt, I should mention, and subject of this book, to reporting on the developments in this part of the world? So it's a really interesting question. I think it's a little bit complicated by the fact that she was married to my great uncle, who was also a journalist. And you have to remember that the timing for this book was right after World War II, where my aunt, my great aunt, had just had opportunity presented to herself to tell stories because men were fighting the war. And then after the war ended, they fizzled because the men came back and took over the jobs that the women had taken on during wartime. And so she had gotten that taste of being a professional journalist and wanted to continue. And then she was also uh, married to my great uncle, who was in the region. And so he helped her get some opportunities to cover uh, the war. They first went to Greece, actually, in 1948 and covered a civil war there. Then they went to Iran. And then they ended up in Belgrade right before a big political moment for the country. And she had to be scrappy. She wasn't a full-time reporter. She was a stringer. So she was always hustling and looking for stories. And I think that that's one of the themes that really comes out in this book is as a woman, she had to work harder, but I tend to be a glass half full person. And so I think with challenge often comes opportunities and not having the full-time job, having to look at things from different angles really allowed her to see stories and to tell the human side of the stories that her male peers just weren't being asked to do and didn't have the time to stop, step back and think about because they were just covering the hard news to hit deadlines. Mm -hmm, The hard facts. So Catherine put her own safety and indeed her own life 
at risk in her efforts to pursue these stories and to report the truth of the uprising against communist rule after World War II in Yugoslavia, Hungary, and in Poland as well. Where do you think she found her strength and resolve to endure the relentless observation by secret police, which you documented very well in this book, and also exposure to threats and violence? So my great aunt and my grandmother grew up in a military family that was also very Southern. So they had this sense of duty and honor that what came from the military background. And then also just the dedication to routine and manners. And so I think that combination plus being able to spend a childhood around the world really gave my great aunt conviction and confidence that most women wouldn't necessarily have. You have to remember at this time, if women worked outside of the home and if they worked on a newspaper, they were often working on the society page. They were not abroad covering news. So just even the fact that she was there, I think speaks to her character. And then I think there was just this dogged commitment to getting the story and getting it right. And she was going to do it no matter what, coupled with perhaps a naivete that she was just going to be able to do what she needed to do to get it done. Um, You know, you mentioned a couple of times in the book that she really risked her life. Mm -hmm. And I think you do that because you have a conviction to wanting to get your, your story out there. And also because you don't think anything's going to happen to you either. Right. The optimism bias. Exactly. From what I know of my great aunt, from the stories that my mom and my uncle shared, um, that was her in a nutshell. She just had the conviction and the courage to get things done. And she just was persistent in pursuing them. Mm -hmm. Which is such a remarkable characteristic. And I think it's, it can be common to many of the press, even today, working in these kinds of oppressive environments and dangerous environments, you would really have to have that conviction to pursue it even at your own risk, when often it's not your own story. You know, you're telling the story of someone else. Exactly. Exactly. I think there's this commitment to sharing the truth and making sure that the world knows what's really happening that really guides journalists who work in war zones or oppressive regimes. Mm -hmm. Repressive governments often seek to obscure the truth or prevent the truth from leaking beyond their borders. And as evidenced in Catherine's own career, and we see it too in history and perhaps today in current events, journalists are seen as the enemy. I mean, if you really think about knowledge, it is power. And it's knowledge that's broad, that gives you perspective. It may not be knowledge that you agree with, but it's knowledge that gives you facts and helps you see the full picture. And oftentimes in non-democratic countries, the government likes to control what is shared and how it's shared, or even if it is shared. And I think you can look throughout history, as well as unfortunately today, at various examples of countries where leaders or governments are using that knowledge to pursue their own goals. They censor information or they write the news themselves. And, you know, we in the United States and in the Western world often forget to think that there is a different way of living. But there's numerous examples, even today, as you mentioned, um, where that is just simply not the case. And so it's really admirable that there are journalists who are willing to risk their lives to make sure that that information is both shared outside of those countries with the rest of the world, but also to try to make sure that that information can, to some extent, be surfaced within those countries as well. Absolutely. That's a very important point that even the populations within these countries may not be privy to the real cold, hard facts. So, Catherine, one of the themes in your book is friendship. And your great aunt, Catherine, formed deep friendships with Mila Vangelis, former deputy prime minister of Tito's Yugoslavia, and his wife, Stephanie, in her pursuit to share the criticisms of communism. Now, in researching this book, you were able to correspond regularly with their son, Alexa. 
how did that connection influence the writing of this book? So I mentioned earlier that um, I had the benefit of speaking to both my mother and my uncle who brought my great aunt to life. You know, I did meet her. She passed away when I was a young girl and they had different moments. My uh, uncle had been in Berlin and I had spent a lot of time with my great aunt and uncle when they were there. And my mother was in DC when my great aunt would come home and visit her mother, who was my great grandmother and my mother's grandmother mother. So Alexa helped kind of round out that that color by sharing his perspective of Catherine and the friendship that he saw between his parents and Catherine and Ed, who's my great uncle, when he was in the mix and in the conversations, they used to spend uh, weekends going to different parks and getting out. And then Gilas was incarcerated for quite a long period of time. And there were times when Catherine wasn't allowed in Yugoslavia. And there were times when she and Ed were both allowed to visit. And so he helped bring those visits to life in a way that even though they left so much great documentation and diaries and letters. It just, you know, made the two-dimensional really three-dimensional. And then I would be remiss if I didn't share that there were a couple of just mysteries. You know, when you when you try to talk about history, um, there's only sometimes so much you can get from primary documentation. And so he was able to help me um, solve some of those mysteries of whether, for example, there was a reporter who was rumored to be a double agent, whether she was or wasn't. Um, and he said, yes, there were rumors, but it was never uh, validated. And so I made sure to write it such that it was a rumor and it wasn't necessarily a fact. So it's it's helpful. And it was just a wonderful connection. You know, the, this friendship between my great aunt and the Gilases in some ways continued through his son and me. And I'm hoping uh, next summer to be able to travel over there and to get to meet him in person. Um, I feel like I already know him, but it's just wonderful to think forward to having that opportunity as well. That's wonderful that you had that opportunity to, to continue the friendship another generation. I want to circle back to talking about the 50s and 60s and the chauvinism of the time that was a recurring stumbling block for your great aunt Catherine and for many female professionals at the time. She was even scooped by her own journalist husband, which of course caused her great frustration. Do you think that women, particularly those who are reporting in violent and repressive environments, still face discrimination and difficulty? Oh, boy. I think um, that there are headwinds for women, for sure, across every industry. And some of that has changed. The dynamics of the headwinds have changed from the 50s. Um, But I I do think it still takes a little bit more for women to break through. And journalism, for sure. I mean, I think we saw this recently with the Me Too movement, um, which impacted the entertainment industry, but also the journalism industry. Mm -hmm. Whether that is more prominent in areas where there's oppressive regimes or not, I don't know. I mean, I think that Every circumstance is probably unique, but overall, I do believe that women still face headwinds for breaking through and be, and being able to kind of have the operational excellence or the perception at the same level that men are in their fields. Since this is such a personal book that you've written here, we mentioned that Catherine Clark was your great aunt. I'd be remiss in not asking what aspects of her character do you think that you might have inherited? I mean, you share the name. Yes. My mother, as I was writing um, the book, uh, was going through all of her paperwork over you know, the decades and found a letter that my great aunt had sent me um, in sending me a book. So in, in my family, we write inscriptions and in books. And she had written about the, the just so stories, which she was giving me um, because they were my grandmother's favorite. And along with the letter, she said, it was so nice to see you. We're both named Catherine. Uh, there's great things expected of Catherine's. And it just felt very timely to find this letter that was written to me when I was eight because I was in the process of trying to get a book published. Okay. And getting a book published is not as easy as at least I thought at the beginning of my journey. Uh, I had to convince 
my agent, um, after being rejected by many agents, that this book was worthy. And then she and I both had to convince a publisher that not only was this not a story about World War II, this was a story not about Russia necessarily in the Cold War. It was about Yugoslavia. And so there was a lot of education that went into it. And I think one of the character traits my great aunt had was persistence. Right. And it really required me to be committed and to pursue this with full vim and vigor. Um, and so I would love to say that I have that same trait that she does. Yeah. And then the other thing that really came out in writing this book was just how loyal she was to her friends, right? even when it wasn't front page news, even when she wasn't getting credit for it. She was constantly almost a one woman PR machine for her friend who was incarcerated to prevent him from being killed mm -hmm. and to make sure that his story still stayed alive. And so that, that notion of loyalty and deep commitment to friendship is something that I really value as well. And so I think those two things, if I think about her character traits and mine, are really the the two areas where we're most similar. Those are very uh, honorable traits. Can I ask you, do you still have that book with the inscription? I do. Yes. That would be very inspiring, I think, to an eight-year-old. Yes, it was. Yeah. What a wonderful memento. What a beautiful thing. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today, Catherine. It was a pleasure speaking with you. If you would like to learn more about Catherine Gregorio and her work, you can go to www.catherinegregorio.com or follow her on Instagram at, at Catherine.Gregorio. You can find her book, The Double Life of Catherine Clark, on Amazon. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. This was an incredibly important story to be told. I think both Catherine's, the author and the journalist, are so inspiring. Oh, I do too. Catherine Clark's story sheds a little light on the level of risk some journalists must accept in their pursuit of the truth. We tend to think that only foreign war correspondents, for instance, those most notably now in Israel and Ukraine, are the only journalists who are at great personal risk for their own health and safety. They can be killed just as any civilian can, and they do sometimes get caught in the crossfire. In some countries, journalists are the targets themselves. But of course, this risk is not limited to war zones. According to Ernest Sagana of the International Federation of Journalists, journalists are often killed for shining a light on corruption in criminal organizations. And those responsible for killing often are not taken to task. He said, killing a journalist has become a risk-free endeavor. That is truly terrifying. But we see evidence of this regularly, don't we? There have been 52 journalists killed in the past five years in Mexico alone. Mr. Saganda goes on to say that it's an open season on journalists in many parts of the world, especially in less democratic regimes. Yeah, well, those journalists are posing a threat to those people, right? They can expose them internationally. There have been many journalists who continue to work knowing that at any moment their own lives may be at stake, but it's a calling, a conviction. In his investigation of the shoe bomber and his link to Al-Qaeda in Pakistan in 2002, Daniel Pearl of the Wall Street Journal was abducted and beheaded by Islamic militants, which is just sickening. And then journalists Stephen Sotloff and James Foley met a similarly tragic fate in 2014. Did you ever read A House in the Sky, which was a memoir by Amanda Lintow? No, I didn't. Okay, I'm going to have to lend it to you. She was a freelance journalist who was abducted along with her colleague and a translator in Somalia. She was held for 460 days in brutal conditions, and it's a truly chilling story. Journalism is a very dangerous business indeed. Indeed. Did you know that one of the most dangerous topics to report on, though, is the environment? Somehow I'm not surprised by this. Yeah. In a Vanity Fair article from 2016, James Warren, the chief media writer, reported that between 2005 and 2016, 40 journalists around the world had died while reporting on environmentally related news. Really? Yeah. And what is even more surprising is that this was a higher number than the number of journalists killed while reporting on the war in Afghanistan. Wow, that puts it in perspective. Yeah, it sure does. Apparently, a good number of these tragedies involve individuals who aren't trained, though, local people trying to uncover illegal activity. Like Cambodian Suan Chan, he was beaten to death for trying to uncover the truth about illegal fishing in his country. 
or Russian Mikhail Bekatov, who died years later from injuries from an attack during which his skull and his legs were crushed. His crime? It is reported that he exposed the fact that the Kimki Forest had been destroyed for the sake of the Moscow-St. Petersburg Freeway. There was a really interesting book published in 2020, which speaks to all of the dangers of journalism. It is called Killing the Story, Journalists Risking Their Lives to Cover the Truth in Mexico, and was written by the award-winning journalist and filmmaker Tamoris Greco. As we mentioned, one of the most dangerous places to report on a story in recent years is Mexico. Mm -hmm. The new press noted that by 2017, Mexico had beat out Iraq and Syria as the deadliest country to work as a reporter. Not a competition you want to win. Definitely not. It's said that a journalist has experienced external aggression almost every 13 hours last year in that country. Did you read the well-known best-selling book, American Dirt, by Janine Cummings? I did. It was amazing. I actually read it while I was in Playa del Carmen, Mexico. Really? Yeah. And the cartel was visible. No. Yes. Even to a tourist like myself. But surprisingly, I read that the majority of aggressions suffered by journalists in Mexico were at the hands of the authorities. Corrupt authorities, I would imagine. Mm. While it's definitely not a problem confined to Mexico, according to UNESCO, between 2006 and 2020, more than 1,200 people working in the media industry lost their lives on the job. Wow. Every four days, somewhere in the world, a journalist is killed. Every four days. It is a wonder anyone wants to do this job. That's madness. While there has been work to confront and counteract these attempts to silence the press, in Mexico, the government created the Mechanism for the Protection of Human Rights Defenders and Journalists, also just known as Mechanism. The Mechanism, as reported by Sarah Kenosian, is the body that provides journalists with protections such as panic buttons, surveillance equipment, home police watch, armed guards, and relocation. That's crazy that that is all deemed to be necessary, but it really is. Well, journalists requesting protection from mechanism don't necessarily receive it, however, as each case needs to be evaluated first. I find it incredible that people pursue a story and pursue the truth in these kinds of conditions, because let's not forget, it's not only the life of the journalists themselves in danger, they often have families too. It would make me think twice, and I'm sure it does have a silencing effect on some. Yeah, which is exactly the objective of those complicit in the murder of journalists around the world. The freedom of the press is critical. Unbiased reporting must be supported. It translates into rights, Mm. security, freedom of thought, movement, equality, and so much more that we really value. This past May 3rd was the 30th anniversary of World Press Freedom Day. This day was declared by the United Nations General Assembly to elevate awareness of the importance of press freedom and to remind governments of their commitment to the freedom of the press. According to the UN, it's also a day to celebrate the principles of press freedom, to assess global press freedom, and defend the media from attacks on their independence, as well as, of course, honor the journalists who have died doing their job. Sounds very worthwhile. Yeah, it really is. Of course, we've all seen a greater volume of information due to increased independent media outlets, as well as the increase in digital technologies. The UN says that alongside this media freedom, safety of journalists and freedom of expression are being targeted more and more. There is a lot of information and conflicting information out there, which dilutes the integrity of journalism as a whole. This impacts people's confidence in the press. Yeah, like that term fake news coined by past President Trump, right? So many just don't know what to believe anymore. Or they believe misinformation that is designed to mislead, generate unrest, and even incite rebellion. And it's everywhere. The UN states that disinformation and misinformation online and offline proliferate. The role of the journalist is more important than ever before. We need trusted reporters, trusted media outlets who verify the facts before disseminating them to the people. Mm -hmm. We need the endless flow of information to be sifted, sorted, and the untruths rooted out. 
Not an easy task. Have you ever heard of BBC Verify? No. Yeah, the BBC is tackling misinformation head on behind the scenes, analyzing not just the printed word, but images, video, and audio too. And they've got forensic journalists and fact checking experts working to uphold, in their words, their rigorous editorial standards. Well, that's reassuring. Mm -hmm. I also came across a website for Forbidden Stories. Have you heard of it? I don't think so. Well, they're a network of journalists who protect, pursue, and publish work of journalists who happen to be in danger, such as being threatened, facing prison, or the risk of being killed. They claim killing the journalist won't kill the story. Wow, that's amazing. That takes the power away from the people who are trying to suffocate their work. It might even save their lives. So how does it work? Well, if a journalist is being threatened, they can submit their story and supporting documents via a secure communication channel through the Forbidden Stories website. If something untoward happens to the journalist, then the Forbidden Stories will make sure that the story survives and is released. Wow, that's really impressive. But it is a terrible thing again that this Mm -hmm. has to be created. It is. They say their goal is to keep stories alive and ensure that, in their words, a maximum number of people have access to independent information, especially relating to the hot-button topics like health, human rights, the environment, and corruption. Yeah, these are all very sensitive and important issues. According to the Forbidden Stories website, they're sending a message to enemies of the free press that even if the messenger is killed, they can't stop the message. Yeah. That story is still going to survive. They ask the very pointed question, what is the point of killing a journalist if 10, 20, or 30 others are waiting in the wings to carry on their work. Yeah, zero point. A relentless tide of truth-tellers. Bingo. Yeah, powerful. There is an assumption that the freedom of the press is only challenged in countries which are not democratic, but this is not the case, is it, Walker? Not at all. Marcus Howard, an associate teaching professor at Northeastern University's School of Journalism, has said, journalism is under threat. A lot of people think we in the United States have a free environment for the press to operate in, but these press freedom trackers have downgraded the United States in some cases. And in an article written by Jackson Cote, people I think would be shocked to hear that journalists around the world are not just being assaulted or killed. They're being arrested, detained, and having their equipment and documents taken and being surveilled or tracked by the government. Coat, among others, referenced the World Press Freedom Index, which in 2022 ranked the U.S. 42nd in terms of press freedoms out of 200 countries. The U.S. was ranked 45 in 2023. Wow. And in case you were wondering, Harris, how Canada was ranked, it was 19 in 2022 and 15 in 2023. I would never have guessed that the rank would be so low. Mm -hmm. I would have thought that both Canada and the U.S. would be higher, frankly. Joel Simon for the Columbia Journalism Review discussed how important it was more than ever before for us all to stand together to support journalists and their freedom. Mm -hmm. Simon notes that the ease of information sharing due to technology has enabled politicians to hijack the information agenda, insurgent groups to disseminate information directly, and governments to flood the zone with propaganda. Well, we're very well aware of that too. According to Fortune, a recent survey claimed that half of Americans believe that major news sources mislead, misinform, or persuade the public pushing their point of view in the process of reporting. Well, that doesn't surprise me in the least. Yeah, human rights filmmaker and visiting teaching professor of journalism at Northeastern University, Jody Santos said, when you say fake news, fake news, or journalists are the enemy, It creates this more permissive environment for physical attacks on the media. It creates an atmosphere where it's permitted to commit violence against journalists. Right. These are small but impactful aggressions against journalists. Again, according to Fortune, people no longer feel that a version of the truth is being reported. It's a version which someone wants us to believe, rather than cold, hard facts. It has made us all uncertain of what to believe now, leading to a lack of confidence and trust in the press. This can be a very dangerous thing. Yeah, very dangerous indeed. 
And these dedicated journalists who fight against the repression of information, mm. who are silenced, who risk the lives of themselves and their families, they must be so disheartened if accused of producing fake news or supporting some kind of higher level agenda that's hidden from public right. view. It must be maddening, particularly because they're are misinformation campaigns going on all the time. So it seems. Yeah. So how do we prepare journalists of tomorrow for the reality that awaits them? And what does this mean for the future of journalism as a whole? Excellent questions. In an article for CBC News, Brody Fenlon shared the findings of the Taking Care Survey, which examined the mental health and overall wellness of 1,200 plus media workers in Canada. And? Well, this 2022 survey uncovered that 10% of those surveyed had considered suicide after the experience of covering traumatic stories, and more than half of those surveyed had required medical assistance to manage work-related stress and trauma suffered on the job. Of course, this is not surprising at all. No. News reporters in particular are often out there being witness to some of the most tragic events elbow to elbow with first responders. Mm -hmm. Another survey this year conducted by the Center for Innovation and Sustainability in local media revealed that 72% of 500 local journalists were suffering from personal burnout and 70% of them were suffering from burnout related to work. Mm -hmm. Brody also noted that the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation was taking these findings seriously, having initiated wellness programs to better support industry workers with work-related stress. A step in the right direction. Yep. Extreme burnout and stress is not the only risk to individual journalists, but it's also a risk to the industry as a whole. Mm. It has to be addressed. I don't think that the trauma and stress and perhaps even the danger can always be avoided, but there are things that can be done to mitigate it. And to add insult to injury, journalists' livelihoods are now being threatened by AI, mm -hmm. which can be viewed as a competitive source. Yeah, AI is certainly on everyone's radar these days. I'm looking forward to diving into artificial intelligence as a standalone episode in the near future, Walker. Can it really be so powerful, though, as to take over the written word that's generated by the human mind? Oliver Whalen quoted Cecilia Campbell of United Robots in the science survey, The Future of Journalism, saying, the type of robot-generated articles we produce are not stylistically advanced, but they sound as if a human has written them. Yikes. And so it goes. Yeah. And there has been an impact already. I read that Build, which is the largest tabloid in Germany, plans on laying off one third, you heard me, one third of their staff. And some of these roles are being replaced by AI. Whoa. Yeah. According to award-winning journalist Khaled Dieb in his article, What Future for Journalism in the Age of AI? Top media organizations will most likely hang on to what he refers to as star reporters and columnists, but perhaps the fate for others may not be so rosy, stating junior, mid-range, and less famous journalists won't be so fortunate. The field of journalism will change even more as this technology develops. How can it not? Yeah. But as Oliver Whelan states, journalism is the sharing of personal human experience, which cannot be quantified or reduced to a set of instructions. I agree. I think we need to safeguard original thought, protect journalism. As the exceptional Christiane Amanpour once said, we journalists are the pillars of reform, of freedom, of democracy, and we are the champions of people who have no voice. Champions of people who have no voice. What on earth can be more important than that? Thank you for joining us at At Home and Abroad with your host, Harrison Walker. If you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate it if you would rate and review our show. It helps us grow and expand our reach. Subscribe to follow us each week as we continue the conversation. You can also say hi to us on Instagram at at Harrison Walker. We would love to hear from you.